Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Conceive, believe, achieve. Shut the f up. <laughs> You're listening to Believe You Me with Michael the Count Bisbing. You know my name yet? And Anthony Lionheart Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, do not adjust your screens. Anthony Smith has not undergone an extreme <laughs> diet. <laughs> Anthony Smith has not lost 20 pounds. Anthony Smith does not have some kind of muscle deteriorating disease. This is the one and only Adam Cattrall. Sorry, buddy. Just uh, just busting your balls. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Anthony will be joining us shortly. He'll be on in just a few minutes. I thought we'd start the show with my yeah, buddy, man. my colleague from TNT Sports, an expert in the boxing world, runs his own podcast, Fight Disciples. He knows the ins and out of the boxing world. He knows the politics. Adam Cattrall, welcome to Believe You Me. It's a, it's a good job that you put that prerequisite in there, mate, because me and uh, Ant have got the same haircut. So people might yeah. genuinely have been confused. So well done. Yeah, I agree. If I can ever get to the size of Anthony Smith, mate, I know that I've, <laughs> I've, I've cracked life. Yeah, yeah. And your accent's changed as well. Uh, oh, mate, while we just wait for Anthony to jump on, I, as I said, I thought you'd be the perfect person to speak to, you or Nick. Um, obviously, you know, we have a good rapport and we're friends and, and you, you do know a lot about the boxing world and you covered the fight for Talk Sport in the UK at the weekend. You do a podcast in the boxing world. So I'm very intrigued to know your opinion of it. Obviously, we're referring to Francis Ngannou and Tyson Fury at the weekend, which was, I mean... I'm very intrigued to know your perspective because not only on the fight, we'll get to that in a minute, but like I saw you put a couple of, shall we say, negative style tweets out there about, yeah. you know, the show in general. But yeah, over to you, Adam. Give me your thoughts, buddy. Can, this Is this the podcast? You can swear on this one, can't you? I can, I can be my normal you self here, can't I? You want, Good brother. Good this lad. ain't TNT. This Just ain't ESPN. This I'm is just... you me. <laughs> No, mate, listen, when the fight was originally made, I thought it was a farce because the WBC heavyweight champion of the world is taking on a geezer that's making his professional boxing debut. Yeah, of course, we know who Francis is. We know that he got mm. to the top of the tree with the UFC and became the champ there. Um, but still, Francis uh, Tyson Fury as the WBC champion, the number one heavyweight in the world of boxing, there was a fight smacking us all in the face. And it was that big unification with Alexander Usyk that we all wanted to see as boxing fans. And even before that, we saw bits of negotiation with Anthony Joshua. And even though Joshua lost his championships, I still think a lot of British boxing fans wanted to see that. So when those things don't materialise, and then you get served up oh, this other fight. There he is, flanked <laughs> look by, at that. as we say in England, Mate. Sconet. You should, you should actually flank that. We look like the Mitchell brothers. You should do <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Put me in the middle, Harrington. Put me in the middle. The Mitchell brothers. You won't get that reference, Anthony. I won't. <laughs> Phil and Grant Mitchell. It's from a soap opera called EastEnders. We literally, literally just started, Anthony, about a second ago. Uh, nice. Adam... Uh, Adam Catchell, you know who Adam is, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. He was just giving us a bit of background on the WBC situation. So we literally yeah, I was just enjoy, I out. was enjoying listening. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Yeah, please go ahead, Adam. So from a British bo boxing fan's point of view, obviously we had a lot of chat, whether it's going to be AJ and Fury, that didn't materialise. Then you've obviously got the U6 situation. So therefore, when you announce that you're fighting uh, a boxing novice, and that's not to be disrespectful towards Francis, that's exactly what he is. He's making his professional boxing debut. I think a lot of boxing fans, and I was definitely one of them, were down on it because we've waited 24 years for an undisputed heavyweight championship fight. This is madness. It's absolutely madness. There's been plenty of opportunities to make it. And I... I'm one of those that is in the firm camp that it comes down to the fighter. If a fighter wants to make a fight, they can make a fight. So there was loads of chat in the UK about whether Tyson Fury actually wanted the fight, whether he wanted to get stuck into Alexander Usyk or not. So I was down on it. I was negative about it. And then, of course, you have all this pomp and ceremony of what type of event it was going to be. And we saw throughout the whole course of fight week, bloody hell, man. Every man and his dog were there, weren't they? Every single person on the planet that had any type to of be there. prowess. Why were you there, man? You'd have got weighed in, wouldn't you, to sit ringside and, I don't know, give, give it the yeah. bin? No, 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 no. I, 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 I was invited and there was a nice little payday, but I've got to go to Brazil tomorrow. <laughs> I've got to go to Brazil. I'm just one man and his dog. I can't be everywhere all at once, even though there's a movie about that. Everywhere, everything, all at once. Anyway, you were saying. But, like I said, every man and his, his dog were there. And I was starting to get a little bit disgruntled with some of the, the narrative and PR that was being pushed in and around the fight. 
we've we've seen crossover fights before. Listen, you guys are, are elite martial artists. You're elite strikers. You've been you've been in these gyms for years and years and years, right? I'm sure that you have spent some time with elite boxers that are just solely boxers, and therefore boxing striking and MMA striking are completely different skill sets. Now we're talking about a contest of a heavyweight champion who's been doing it all his life. He's grown up doing it. It's the only thing he's ever done and he's the best in the world at it. Taking on a guy that 18 months ago was in MMA, doing brilliantly in MMA, of course. Since then, he's had major knee reconstruction and then he spent time learning the craft of boxing. Holding your hands up like this for uh, 36 minutes is a lot different than a than an MMA contest. Of course, if you're getting used to ready for takedowns, your arms are in a different position. I always thought that it was a bit of a farce of a matchup. How bloody wrong could I have been? Because Francis Ngannou pulled all the pants down. I thought he looked absolutely fantastic. Completely exceeded all my expectations of what he could do in a boxing ring. And I think he's bloody unlucky not to have his hand raised at the end of it. What was your take on the fight, Anthony? Did you think that well, he won? Yeah, I did. I did. I thought Francis won. Um, I thought it was really close. I wouldn't call it a robbery. Um, I agree. But I thought that if it went to a decision, there was no point to score it because they were never going to give Francis and Ghana a decision win over uh, Tyson Fury. I just didn't think that was going to happen. But I found myself sitting around after the fight talking to a bunch of my friends. We had this big kind of get together. We're cooking seafood and alligators and we're and they're asking me my opinion. It- about. It's not Northern England, Anthony. Cooking alligators. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fish and yeah, chips we, where we're from. Well, it was crawfish and crab legs and shrimp and an alligator. So we're all standing around having some beers. And they're, they're, they're telling me essentially how wrong I was about my take and how I owe Francis and Ghana an apology. And that I needed to come on here and go on my radio show. And I needed to apolog- apologize to Francis and Ghana for not believing in him. Now, for a second, I started to believe that a little bit like, God, man, maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. Maybe I do need to kind of just eat crow a little bit. But the more that I've thought about it over the last couple of days, Francis and Ghana has never done anything to give any legitimate any legitimate analyst that said Francis and Ghana was going to stand there and outbox Tyson Fury at his own game. Doesn't know what he's talking about, because there is no film that exists of Francis and Ghana looking like he did on Saturday. There, it's never mm-hmm. there's nothing on film that shows that his his pad work doesn't even show that when he's no. doing his open workouts i thought after watching his pad workout like this is going to be worse than i thought it was going to be so Same. i don't know that i owe him an apology i'm so happy for him i'm mm-hmm. i'm for as proud as i can be of a guy that i don't know very well I'm proud of Francis Ngannou. I think that he looked incredible. I thought his jab was nice. He was conditioned very well. We've never find a film where Francis Ngannou looks well conditioned. It, it, mm. You can't find it. So, I mean, he gassed in a three round fight with Derek Lewis where they threw yeah. a combined 13 strikes or something. And he yep. was tired. I mean, and this isn't me shitting on him. This is me bigging him up. Yes. I think that he far exceeded any expectations. I think that he should be proud of everything that he did in there. And I was proud to say that I'm a a former MMA fighter alongside of Francis Ngannou. I thought he was great, but I don't know that he's owed any apologies. I think he should get all the praise and respect for his performance that we could possibly give him. Without question. And and you're absolutely right, because I'm sure I'll speak on behalf of all three of us and any analyst on the planet. Nobody thought Francis was going to do that. So we don't owe him an apology, but we owe him a congratulations. Yeah. A yeah. Well done. You just pulled it out of the bag. You proved the world wrong. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was unexpected, unbelievable, un everything. It well, was, and, you know and what and I how mean? Many, how many pundits and boxing guys did you C say, well, he needed a warm up. He, he, he doesn't deserve to be in there with the greatest. He, he doesn't deserve the ass beating that we think he's going to get. There's, can you imagine what it would have looked like if it was anyone but Tyson Fury that doesn't have the movement, the, the defensive responsibility, the size, the, all of the things that Tyson Fury brings to the table is the only thing that kept him awake the entire time. Any other guy, he sleeps completely. Mm-hmm. Adam, let me ask you this. So the, the theory was a lot of people thought Tyson was going to carry him, you know, put on a yeah. show, play yeah. with him, put on a people for the Saudis, much like people say 
Mayweather did with Conor McGregor. That wasn't the case. He went out there in the opening seconds, went at him like a bull in a china shop, tried to knock him out from the get-go. I think, in my opinion, he thought, I'm going to catch him off guard. He's too slow for me. I'm going to hit him with a big one, so I'm going to sit him down. Look at that. Look at that. First shot, he's done. Is that what you thought? Mate, I was one of those people in, in the in the build-up to this where I thought, he's going to go out, have three minutes, have a look, realise that Francis isn't a boxer, then he's going to carry it, give these people their money's worth, and then when Francis gasses, he'll take him out and that'll be the end of that and everybody will move on towards the Usyk fight. And I was surprised, actually. He came straight out the gate, threw that big right hand, didn't he? And I think... If I'm really, really honest, it didn't look like the normal Tyson Fury. We've all seen Tyson Fury be miles better than what we saw, obviously, at the weekend. I think he's gone in there and he's kind of drunk a little bit of that Kool-Aid that maybe all the pundits were talking about, saying, this is easy, mate. It's an easy payday. Turn up, go and do your thing. Maybe he's not trained fully. Maybe he has gone in psychologically thinking to himself, this is going to be a a pretty easy contest. He's gone out to try and get him out of there early. And then he's realised... Francis is a tough motherfucker. He took some good wax. You know, we haven't seen him be knocked out in the UFC or in MMA. He has gone the distance and he's lost decisions, but nobody's chinned him. So he's obviously got a chin of granite there and he's he's, he's taken a good couple of clumps in the first couple of rounds. And I think Fury's gone, what the f*** is happening here? I've, I'm, I'm, I'm not conditioned for 10 rounds here. This is going to be... And then he just looked like... He looked like the shit. novice. There was, there, there was certain like points... Shit. Mate, there's certain points in that fight where I'm thinking... And, and I was speaking to Nick a little bit earlier about this. He said, if you're an alien and you've just been plonked on the planet and you're asked the question, which one of these has never boxed before? You go, the, the ball fella, right? Oh, God. That's what, yeah, that's what mean, you would do, wouldn't you? That's true. I mean, that's fair. Yeah. Like my, 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 my wife knows nothing about combat sports, really. When I walked out, because I was doing a live stream, I walked out, she goes, how did Tyson win that? He lost that fight. She knows nothing about it. She was just watching it on the other screen. As you say, look at them from the from the body type, the eye test. It's Engarnu. If you look at the bigger shots, it's Engarnu. If you, I mean, it was Fury that looked like the MMA fighter. Number one, hits him with the elbow. And yeah. why was all that clinching? He was on his knees at one point. As, as fighters, on. you, you two must have been so impressed with one of the patients and the way that he just kept his frame all the way through the fight. When he when he knocked him down in the third, I thought, right, here we go. Windmill, go for it. This is your chance. Mate, he was like, nah, man, I've got all day. Don't worry about that. I've done the work. It's fine. He was so impressive just from an attitude point of view, just as well as obviously from the physical aspects of what he was performing. I, I wonder what, what it took in practice or training or, or whatever that changed Francis's approach. Maybe it's the danger factor of Tyson Fury. Maybe it's the moment. Maybe it's the negotiations, all the, 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 the contract stuff, the waiting, the, it seemed like, it seemed like none of that stuff happened. He was so calm. He, he was very, and I, and I think I talked about this last week, Mike, when they had their sit down interview and it, it started to skew me a little bit on what I thought was going to happen because that Francis Ngannou seemed like a very calculated, very aware, very, very self-aware, very honest version. There was, and he didn't seem, you know how I talk about the, the John Jones steep a thing where I think that it's going to be a different fight than a lot of people believe because these are two Titans at the top of their game. This isn't one guy climbing the mountain trying to, make it to the top and the other guy's just already been there. And so like John typically has that advantage over people because he is the Titan and he's already been there. Um, I I got that vibe with Francis and Tyson. Like Francis isn't a boxer, but he's absolutely a superstar and been the best in the world. And he's been at the top of the mountain. So I, I felt like he didn't have that same approach to Tyson Fury. And I don't think Tyson seemed to enjoy that very much in that sit down. You will think about this. I mean, if you look at Francis Ngannou, I mean, just look at the man. Just look at Francis Ngannou. He's <laughs> Why would you be afraid of anybody? He's carved from stone. He's never been knocked out. He was the UFC heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah, to, that's where I was going. Why would you feel intimidated? And especially when we saw what he did. The big thing that shocked me was, yeah, the cardio was shocking. The skill was shocking. Dropping him in the third round was shocking. But it was the speed. The speed of him, Adam. Uh, yeah. Now, how did and he, he score? fought Southpaw most of the fight? Yeah, he switched which, stances which is as well. Crazy. So We've never he seen showed him do a that lot. Either. 
of technical ability. Adam, what was your scorecard if you did one? Um, I did a watch along in the, in the immediacy. And I, when, when the fight finished, I concluded that it was 6-4 in favour of Tyson. But I've got to be honest, because I was doing it for a live radio station. The last round, I didn't pay full attention to it. So I, I produced it in my ear and all this type of stuff. So I went mm. back and rewatched it. I've scored it five rounds apiece with a knockdown being the deciding factor. Francis Ngannou takes it by a point. That's that's my overall conclusion of what I saw at the weekend, mate. So, and let me follow, f- follow up with this because you are heavily embedded in the sport of boxing and that's why I'm going to ask you this on it. And I'm not trying to cause any controversy or di- be oh, disrespectful. The, all of the... You know, if you go online, there's so many people criticizing the sport of boxing. And you know what I'm talking about. We all do. That it's it's rigged and that it's it's a crooked sport and all yeah. the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it was a robbery. And no. I'll be honest, when I first watched it, I thought Tyson probably did enough just to edge it. But I was doing a live stream as well. Didn't have producers in my years, but I'm a bloody <laughs> I'm all over the place. I'm You're reading comments. I'm doing I'm a professional. But um, what do you think? Do you do, do you think the fact that the fact that the fight with Usyk was booked, there's yeah. a tremendous amount of money on the line there. Yeah. I mean, do you, I mean, it, it's a big shout to say that that was a fix. It's not a fix, but do you think there was some influential there influence? Do you know? Do you know something? It's it's so hard to not consider it, and the reason you have pointed one major reason out there, the the whole chat building up to the to the Ingarnu fight was. We're doing Usyk on December the 23rd. Alexander Usyk's in the crowd. The whole thing was, go and smash this dude. And this fe- other fella's going to get in the ring and we're going to go nose to nose and we're going to announce this next fight. So there's an element of that. There's a lot of money, obviously, on the line for that. There's a lot of money invested in that particular fight as part of this big festival that Saudi Arabia are having uh, in, in Riyadh season. There's also the element of, listen, we're, we're human beings, right? The judges are human beings. So therefore, they will have gone and sat ringside there with a preconceived idea of what's going to go on. You're not supposed to do that as a judge. I get it. But you will have had a preconceived idea. Right, sound. Here we go. We know how this is going to play. Cool, man. You pro- we're not even probably going to be needed, but we're going to go and do our thing anyway. And then you kind of, I found myself, especially in the second round, first round, I scored it to Tyson. In the second round, I found myself thinking, am I really seeing what I'm seeing? Is this guy actually doing what I think he's doing, or is he just doing better than he did in, in, in the first round? Is he because of the perception moments? that yeah. you had going in there? Is he is he actually doing this? And it took me a couple of rounds to actually think, "Fuck hell, <laughs> he's actually doing what 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 he's supposed to be doing." So to say that it's a rob, it's absolutely not a robbery. I personally think six four Fury, so he wins by a point with the knockdown, or five five. Ngannou wins by point. I think they're both very, very fair. I think it's completely unfair to have a 7-3 scorecard in favour of Tyson Fury, which is one of the scorecards that did mm. come in. And um, So maybe that's where people are talking robbery and uh, corruption and all this type of stuff. I personally don't see the corruption element of it. I think it was an incredibly tight, close fight. And those preconceived ideas maybe swayed judges in moments that they shouldn't have been swayed in. Because like I said, on a second rewatch, I've sat down and gone, Francis Ngannou won that fight. And, and mm-hmm. that's how I had it. I had it 5-5 with the one ten eight round in the third, which would have left Francis uh, ahead one point. But again, I wouldn't say it's a robbery. I, what, what, what bothers me, though, is I do believe that in the rounds that were very, very close, that I thought Francis was just a little bit ahead on, but were very, very competitive. I think all those rounds ended up with Tyson Fury. Because he is Tyson Fury, and this is, eh, it's kind of close. We'll go Tyson, and, and that's uh, that bothers me. It bothers me. The only reason I'm not more irritated by it is because I think Francis still won. If that makes any sense, I think that. Oh yeah. Anything he was gonna gain with the with a legitimate win, other than the 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 W on his record because the titles weren't up for grabs, if I'm correct. Um, the only thing he doesn't get is a win over Tyson Fury, but I don't think that he lost anything else. I, I think that right. well, he showed he himself it. very, very well. I think that he, he's going to... I I thought that this would be a one-off. He would get the absolute beat out of him, and we'd never see Francis Ngannou in boxing again. He'd go into the PFL, make a million dollars here and there, and then sail off into the sunset, a very rich man. 
I found myself Saturday night not wanting to see Francis and Ganu fight MMA anymore. Same. I, like I same. Fuck the PFL. Like yeah. just do this fight Wilder, and then figure it out and get back to a rematch with he, Tyson Fury for for every single title he has. He's absolutely legitimized himself in the boxing space. He's absolutely well, he's in the top ten that. now, right? Well, the WBC have said that they're going to rank him in the top set. I mean, take whatever you, WBC or is whatever yeah. as they come, mate. You know what I mean? But yeah, he is, he's, the performance has absolutely legitimized himself in the boxing space. I think the perfect analogy of everything that you saw at the weekend is that Tyson Fury might have won the fight, but Francis Ngannou won the night. He's the well, one well, that well, walks well, away. I, I think, just to jump in there, I think Ngannou won the fight, but lost the, the, the game. You know what I mean? In terms of landing punches, maybe, maybe we could formulate an opinion for Tyson Fury. But in terms of the fight, in terms of the fight, if that was a real fight, he did the fight. He won the fight. He did the damage. He knocked him down. And don't get me started on this, if this was a mixed martial arts contest. When he <laughs> oh, that's a dead the third man. round, instead Love of Engarnu having a little jiggy, <laughs> having a little shake, you know what I mean? He would have dived on him, hendo UFC 100 style hammer fist to the face, <laughs> obliterated him and put him to sleep. Do you know what I mean? So this baddest man on, on the planet stuff, that's out the window for Tyson yeah. Fury. I'm sorry, buddy. It, now, you're all just said right. All right, this episode is sponsored by Kudo Popcorn. Listen, if you are looking for a snack, if you're trying to stay lean, if you want to stick to a keto-esque diet, but you want a snack, you were sitting down, you're watching a film, you're watching a movie, you're a little peckish in the afternoon, well, Kudo Popcorn is the way to go. Number one, this stuff is absolutely delicious. You've probably seen it all over the UFC because they're sponsoring that now. It comes in a variety of flavors and they're all awesome. The garlic parmesan, probably my favorite. You got the white cheddar and the salty, sweet kettle popcorn. So if you're hitting the gym, going for a long hike or just looking to eat healthier, you should almost certainly be taking whey protein to help boost muscle protein synthesis and the growth of lean muscle mass. And that is where Kudo Popcorn comes in because it's gluten-free, preservative-free, 100% whole grain, keto-friendly, and only has 70 calories per cup. And it's made right here in the US of A. So one bite and Kudo Popcorn will become your go-to healthy snack because it's blooming delicious. Simple as that. You've seen them all eating it. Michael Chandler, Robbie Lawler, Bruce Buffer, even Dana White himself endorses this. So you can get 25% off your entire order when you go to kudosnacks.com and use the promo code BELIEVE. That is correct. 25% off when you go to kudosnacks.com and use the promo code Code believe support the official protein popcorn of the UFC. So, so what what will happen next? Because I personally would like to see a rematch between Engano and Fury, and I think we will get that down the line. As mm -hmm. we know, Fury and Usyk were in the octagon in the ring, <laughs> and Frank Warren, obviously December twenty third, that's on the table. Frank Warren straight away played that down and said, oh, no, yeah. no, we got to wait. As we know, yeah, I mean, he's just thinking about Tyson Fury. He's thinking about big fights. He's thinking, hold on a minute. We're not putting this Fury in there with Usyk because that will not go well. And I'm not taking away from Engano, and I'm not saying that Fury didn't prepare because after the fight, I've seen some interviews. He said, listen, I'll, I'll respect to Fury. He held yeah. his hand up and said, listen, 100%. it was a tough fight. He surprised me. No excuses. I pushed myself in training camp and all the rest of it. Um, but he doesn't want to go in off the back of that with the confidence being dropped and not looking like he usually does against Usyk. So the, the, you've probably seen it. Apparently, if he doesn't fight on December 23rd, he will be stripped. Now, this is what I wanted to ask you, Adam, because you know the ins and outs and the politics of the sport better than I do. What is the actual situation there? Bro, bro, there's no way that the WBC are stripping Tyson Fury. They like their sanctioning fee, mate. There's not a cat in hell's chance that they are going to take uh, that belt off him. Um, when, you, when you sign contractually to, to fights, the sanctioning body belts aren't attached to those contracts. You're just signing to be contractually obliged to fight that particular guy. So that is a discussion. I'm led to believe that that was bound September, uh, December 23rd 
Tyson Fury told us that pre-fight. I'm 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 alleged to thinking that it is a bound date, but now we're hearing that obviously they're going to try and push this uh, into the new year. This is all part of this Riyadh season thing. So this Riyadh season thing in Saudi Arabia uh, finishes at the start of March, end of, end of February. So I'd always anticipated that it would be at the back end, like a closing ceremony, if you will, of this Riyadh season for that und- undisputed fight. There's the amount of money that is in that fight. There is not a cat in hell's chance that the WBC are taking that belt off him. None whatsoever. They haven't called a mandatory since uh, Dillian White, which is back, uh, what, 18 months ago. The reason why they allowed their champion to fight a guy making his professional boxing debut is because he said, oh, he's tried to make fights. He hadn't. He hadn't really tried to make any fights with any other guys. It was about this. Boxing revolves around the pound note or the dollar sign. And there's so much money in that undisputed fight. There's, there's no way that the belt is going anywhere. He, he will not get stripped. I guarantee it. Wait, uh, I would be, I would love to be like a fly on the wall of, in, in like the camp and manager's offices of all those other top 10 heavyweight boxers right now. I yeah. wonder how quickly they're going to try to match themselves with other boxers not named Francis Ngannou before their before Francis's name comes across their desk. I can't imagine because I did see I don't know if he filmed it before or after the fight, but I did see Deontay Wilder calling for a fight with Anthony Joshua. Yeah. We got to do this. Our fans deserve it. If that was I before. Was, that, was, that before. was before. If I was yeah, those yeah. two, I would imagine that they're probably trying to get that contract signed as fast as possible before people start calling about Francis and Ghana Wilder, Francis and Ga- Francis and Ghana Joshua, because he's going to fuck up all of those plans for all those guys. So let if me he looks, if he looks anything like he looked on Saturday, I've got a question for both of you. And Adam, mm-hmm. you know the sport of boxing better, so I'll throw it to you first. And this is going to sound like the most disrespectful question to Tyson Fury ever, right? And it's not intended to be, but it's just a thought that I'm having. Engano's never boxed. Yeah. Comes over, in some people's opinion, a lot of people beat him, right? Yeah. When you look at the record of Tyson Fury, you go back to when was it? When, when he beat Klitschko. That was 2015. Since then, I mean, Deontay Wilder, Hits hard, he's fast. I think we can all agree, not the most technical boxer. Then he beats Derek Chisora. Give me the question, Mike. I Dillian know where you're going. White, Give it me, Wallen. baby. Are we, saying, are we saying that this generation of heavyweight boxers aren't f***ing all that? Because I tell you what, that's what it's looking like from a layman's perspective right here. Because a man that's never done it, that's a superior athlete, just went in there on his first fight and beat him. Because I'm telling you, whilst there's all tough guys, I know Dillian White. I used to train with Dillian White. He came up and was a sparring partner for Quinton Rampage Jackson. Sure, way a long time ago. But Rampage was doing all right. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I did all right when I sparred with him. So all we say, I mean, does this hurt the stock of not only Tyson Fury, but of all the heavyweights that are competing right now? I mean, because Deontay, Chisora, Dillian White, Andy AJ. Ruiz, AJ, do you know what I mean? What's your thoughts on what I just said? Listen, I don't think any boxing fan would argue with me when I say that this era compared to previous eras is not at the standard. I mean, I'm I'm lucky to be that kid that grew up watching the 1990s heavyweights, you know, that Lennox level Lewis. of guys, where yeah. they're all Tyson, you know, Vander, all those guys, Rick Ball, all those fellas. When I were there, there I mean, that, that was probably the second great era of heavyweight boxing compared to the Ali era that came uh, a few decades before it. This decade absolutely isn't up to that standard. You would think that Tyson Fury is the number one, but there's a debate as to whether he is or whether he isn't compared to Alexander Usyk, who's been undisputed at Cruiserweight, stepped up and now beating Anthony Joshua and become unified as a heavyweight. So regarding the question as to whether this era isn't all that, compared to previous eras, absolutely. But what Francis Ngannou did at the weekend Again, I keep thinking to myself, is this now going to legitimise every single MMA fighter wanting to cross over and step into the world of boxing? I don't know if it does. It most certainly legitimises Francis Ngannou and it absolutely makes him a player in the game. Regarding what Anthony was saying a minute or two ago, I think Francis Ngannou's the golden goose now. I think he's the unicorn in the division. I think if you've got anything about yourself, you want to fight that guy because... 
you now know. You now know what he can do. Tyson Fury didn't know. He didn't mm-hmm. have tape, did he? He didn't know what he, what, what he could do boxing-wise. He went in there and kind of freestyled it a little bit. He's ambled his way through and he's just had his hand raised. Now people are going to go, oh, fucking hell. This, guy, this guy's actually all right. Okay, proper camp. Come, you know what I mean? He does this, he does that. I'm going to have to do this and do that to, to counter what this fella can do. But from a casual fan's point of view, on the widest uh, aspect of stuff, he brings so many eyeballs. He's, he is pound signs just screaming off the table. If you're Anthony Joshua, Wilder, all these guys, I'm like going, I'll fight Francis Ngannou. I'll have a go with Francis Ngannou. Let me fight Francis Ngannou because I reckon I can outbox him for 12 rounds. You might not knock him out, but you can outbox him for 12 rounds maybe. You know, to, to answer Mike's question, I, I think if I'm just being honest, and, and this isn't even fair to say to Francis because I don't think this is a Francis exposed the weakness that is the heavyweight division right now. I think that Francis just showed he's right there with every single one of those guys. I think it says more about Francis than it does boxing, but I think from the outside looking in, I I think this was worse for legitimate boxing than influencer boxing has ever been. Because that was always supposed to be kind of a dog and pony show a little bit. But that's where I'm going next, Anthony, when you finish your point, because I've got a hot take. So maybe I'm going to make it. I don't know. But I think that when we see legitimate boxers, whether they're very good or not very good, or or you see influencers boxing each other, we kind of know what we're getting ourselves into. We know this is bullshit. It's kind of for fun as long as it's entertaining. It's the only reason I was mad about the Logan Paul, Dylan Danis fight was because it not only is it not boxing, it just wasn't even fun to watch. <laughs> so that that was kind of my knock there. But the, this is different. This is one of our best versus one of the, the you know, the best. And it, it that's not how it's supposed to look. You know, it, whether we do have boxing in our training, that's not what Francis does. That's not his nope. game. The striking is different. The angles are different. You're used to defending takedowns. There's knees, elbows, and kicks to change up the distance. It's a different sport, whether everyone else wants to admit it or not, that, that has a small part of boxing in it. And in 18 months or less, I mean, I would say probably less than that because of the the knee reconstruction, less than that. uh, He he just kind of went into the boss's house and kind of took everything. I think that's a bad look for heavyweight boxing. And not only did he do that, and I guess this kind of elaborates on the question that I had about the state of boxing. I think in some ways it doesn't show that all those boxes are bad. It shows a few things. One, mixed martial arts fighters are f-ing up there, okay? And we've had all this press and we've had all this theory and we've had a Jake Paul singing it that these MMA guys can't hang. And yeah, okay, people might say, oh, you can't all hang on Francis Ngannou's coattails because he did something great. But Yes, we can. Yes, we f-ing can. <laughs> yes, we can. And we're can. F-ing going to. Because in our sport, he got beaten a few times, right? Mm-hmm. Jake Paul's out there picking off. He's cherry picking, and we all know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, weaker, uh, older Older. opponents, right? Where the fire has gone out. When you're a fighter, when that internal fire, that competitiveness that Tyron Woodley had once upon a time, that Anderson Silva had once upon a time, and even Nate Diaz looked garbage, right? Mm -hmm. You put him up against anyone in the UFC, we know what's going to happen. Put him in there with you. Put him in there with me. Put him in there with Alex Pereira. Put Francis Ngannou in there with Tyson fucking Fury. Okay, we saw what happened there. So it isn't so much as making MMA, uh, sorry, boxing guys look bad. Finally, now, once and for all, we've had a true crossover between MMA guys in the prime. And what was the other time? Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather. And Conor did all right. Yeah, Floyd might have carried him a bit, but he did way better than the greatest of all time, shall we say? He did a lot better than legitimate boxers did. A lot of Your thoughts, Anthony. uh, So your thoughts, Mr. Adam Catchell. It's hard. I'm looking at you both. I don't know who's who. You got the same hoodies on. (laughs) You got the same smile. (laughs) Hold on. What's your middle name, Adam? Martin. What's your Jay. middle name? Oh, you bastards. Wouldn't that have been It should have been Martin. <laughs> yeah, amazing. What do you think, Adam? Um, yeah, listen, I've, I find it difficult because I'm treating this as a, a bit of an anomaly because I haven't seen this before. With the, with the, with the Mayweather-McGregor situation, I, I agree with the narrative of 
listen, Mayweather carried it a little bit. He made it look to the extent that you wanted it to look like. And then obviously the elite boxer took over and, and he did what he was supposed to do. I'm not knocking Connor because it's not his first discipline, but that's how I uh, perceive that fight. This and was completely different. Yeah, but this was completely different. And I, I put that down to the uniqueness of Francis Ngannou. And we've listen, you've all seen how he's developed as a martial artist. That first attempt at becoming champion when he uh, gassed and was ragdolled all over the place from Stipe to when he actually ended up beating Stipe, mate, chalk and cheese, absolutely chalk and cheese. And then when he was finishing his tenure as the UFC champion, just the poise, the composure, the, how relaxed he was compared to where he was right at the start. This is a, an intelligent man, a guy that is obviously a really good at learning certain things. And... Mm. Because I hadn't seen it before from anybody else, I didn't think it was possible because of how yeah. high a regard I put on mixed martial arts and how high of a regard I put on the sweet science than being, as Anthony just said, two very different disciplines. This dude now, who was really good at this thing, has gone and become really good at this thing. I didn't think that was possible. So now that is obviously going to inspire it. It's like that edge of saying, isn't it? People people don't believe it's possible until it's actually done. Francis has done it now. He's put it in front of everybody's face. So people like, and I know that Sean O'Malley, for example, has been on social media today. People like him are going to go, ah, it is actually, right, okay. So if I go and dedicate six months of my life to purely boxing, nothing else, just purely boxing, how good am I going to then become? And there'll be but, lords now looking into that narrative of being able to try and transition over because let's be straight, there's a shitload of money in it. There's a shitload of money. But to be fair to boxing, and me and Anthony have spoken about this both on this show, we've both sparred high level boxers and they have a field day with us. You know yeah, what I mean? Not, I've sparred guys. <laughs> I've sparred guys that, that that are fast, that are lighter than me, that have gone through the amateur ranks, you know, Olympic hopefuls, and you spar with them, and sometimes you can't even land a glove on them. You know, so I've got to give credit to, to high-level yeah. boxing. You know what I mean? What we saw from Tyson Fury wasn't high-level boxing. Now, he said that he didn't take him lightly. He said that he did an 8- to 12-week camp. He was on his knees. He was sloppy. He was grabbing. Um... Uh, he was tiring, as was uh, Francis. So I just wanted to you know, just give a, a fair comment to boxers as well. I'm not saying... Yeah, absolutely. But what I think, I think, but hand to hand. I think Tyson the, Fury gets a lot of credit yeah. because he did he did something that no other boxer has been willing to do uh, other than Floyd. And that was give a legitimate top-level, UFC-level, like champion-level fighter an opportunity in their prime. Jake Paul. We bro. talk about Jake Paul. He's picking off old, retired guys that are, and you know what? I'm happy for those guys too because, not for nothing, they got big old fat checks as well. And I, and that's what I want. I want if they're going to sail off and get, kind of be a little bit compromised, better if they do it with Jake Paul and get a big check, than you know on the undercard somewhere making twenty grand. So you know that has a place as well. But mm -hmm. there, there's no other guys at the level of Tyson. Lomachenko is not grabbing one of these UFC champions and trying to fight. He's just not going to like tank. Davis is not going to fight Sean O'Malley just in case he might get beat. He's not going to do that. I think Tyson Fury deserves a lot of credit for giving a guy who looks like Francis, who moves like Francis, who has the knockout reel that Francis has an opportunity because Tyson's already shown that he can't be hit. He can be dropped. He can be hurt. And he still gave a guy that that knocks people out the way that Francis does an opportunity. You see, it's an interesting take that. And, I, I, and now you've said it, it's obviously making me think about it. And you think, yeah, that's a good perspective to actually look at it. But from knowing the inside of boxing, the majority of people will look at it and go, you didn't fight AJ, you didn't fight Usyk, but you're fighting Francis Ngannou, who's never boxed before, boxing debut. A lot of people are looking at it going, it's easy money, that. I'm going to go and crack on and do it that way. But now that you've said that, Anthony, it's interesting. It's an interesting take. Yeah, but, but but I do agree with you, though, because you're right. There is a lot of big, big fights for Tyson Fury that he wasn't taking. I mean, come on, as British guys, the whole of the nation <laughs> has been clamoring for years to see Anthony yeah. Joshua and Tyson Fury. Yeah. And, of course, he always makes these unrealistic demands. He's the man, he's the A-side and all the rest of it, and he's hard to negotiate with. Do you think now... We're going to see a change in the approach of Tyson Fury. Do you think, because I feel like he's got a, 
he's got some work to do to try and get some of that respect back, certainly within the boxing community. Eddie Hearn's out there saying that that was an absolute shit show, uh, says that Anthony Joshua will knock him out, I believe. I, th- I think that's what he said. Um, what do you think is going to be, not only we know he's going to fight Usyk next, what do you think his strategy in terms of a general PR approach will be, or do you think he won't change a thing? No, I think, Mike, you highlighted it a moment or two ago. I think he's, from what I've seen, I haven't seen everything, but I think he's handled it relatively well. I've seen a bit on social media with his interviews. He said, no, I don't want to take anything away from him. This is the fight game. The fella's come in. He's completely surprised me. Respect to him. I think that's the right thing to do. Um, And you're right. There is a little bit of a rebuild here. Have the rest. Don't fight December the 23rd because I think it's too short of a period of time. Go away and come back as the elite Tyson Fury that every single boxing fan wants to go and see and make sure that the next opponent is Alexander Usyk. If the elite Tyson Fury turns up, I'd back him to come through a fight with Usyk based on size and skills. And I think he could come through that and become the undisputed champion. Then I would love him to say, listen, you lot think Francis Ngannou beat me, yeah? Come on then, go again. And this time, belt's on the line. Yes. Come, on, come, on, come and fight for the heavyweight championship of the world. Let's see how good you really are. And then, from a Tyson Fury point of view, take it 100% seriously, do a 10 12 week camp, and go in there and show the very, very best version of yourself. So you, so you don't have you don't have Francis fight anybody else in the meantime. Um, he could do, mate. And do you know something? He could beat a large percentage of that top ten in boxing. Yeah. From, from, from what I saw at the weekend, listen, that's a that's a gun show, isn't it? Yeah. Wilder hits hard, Ngannou hits hard. Whoever lands first, he's got. Who's he not paying to see go. that fight? Mate, it's right. massive. That's a lot I, of money. I think like a, a even like a Ruiz. With the that I, 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 I think I, the top two from a financial point of view would be Wilder or AJ. If you're not fighting, yeah. if you're not fighting Fury, Wilder or AJ make an awful lot of sense because not only do they make a lot of money, there's a realistic chance that he could win. There's yeah. a realistic chance that Francis Ngannou could win those fights. Deontay Wilder, Francis Ngannou in the oh PFL. God. We heard he's training MMA for seven months. What do you what's your take yeah. on that, boys? <laughs> Mate, I don't know if I, Wilder's big enough. I really don't. He's just not. And again, I'm talking like he's never won a fight. Like we've seen Wilder no, knock out lots of really big dudes. I don't know. Francis Ngannou's got a serious chin on him, and I yeah. think a fi- I think Francis wins a firefight. And I can't believe I'm saying that after watching. Like, I, if you would have told me Friday before they fought, come Monday when you're sitting on there with Mike. <laughs> You're going to be telling the whole world that you think that Francis Ngannou wins a firefight with Deontay Wilder. <laughs> well, well, After watching him fight, I would have been like, hey, no, hey, hey. not a fucking In a mixed martial chance. arts contest, <laughs> Francis Ngannou picks up Deontay Wilder like Demetrius Johnson, puts him in his pocket, mm-hmm. dances around a little bit, and then does like a bloody side body slam and squashes into bits. 100%. Because in mixed martial arts, that's not happening. That should not get sanctioned. Simple no, no. as that. No. When, Listen, but after, during the as soon the decision is even read yet, and they're saying, "Well, what if he doesn't win?" Like, and then he probably goes and smokes Wilder. That's fucking crazy to say out loud. He but would. That's he, how I. That's what I feel like. Look at Wilder's legs. He would kick them once and break them. <laughs> right. He would break them. No, I'm talking, in bo- I'm talking in boxing. I think he wins a firefight in a boxing match. You'd, you'd have to back him. You'd have to. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. He took less damage than Wilder. Well, well, first of all, it was he got stopped by him twice, right? Or was one was a draw, one was a stoppage. Was it two stoppages or one decision? Two stoppages. Stoppage? Two, two stoppages. stoppages. Two stoppages. Two stoppages. Well, 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 that never happened, did it? Do you know what I mean? Oh dear. Um, final thoughts, then we're going to move on to a quick other couple of things, Adam. We won't keep you too long because I know it's home. You've been kickboxing with the oh, lad. Right. It's yeah. late there. Um, what are your final thoughts on all that stuff before we move on, Adam? Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? And Anthony, of course, as well. Um, Not necessarily off my chest, just a case of a lot of people obviously saw the event at the weekend um, and boxing is always going to be compared to the MMA, in particular the UFC. From a fan perspective, I think a lot of younger demographics are uh, are gravitating towards the UFC and away from boxing because boxing's annoying them. We don't get the best fights all the time. We get crap undercards, all, the, all those types of things. And at the weekend, you saw a different type of marketing, didn't you? Where the guys in Saudi Arabia spent an awful lot of money and a lot of delegates to sit 
ringside. A ring came out the floor. We had a Super Bowl halftime concert for a pre-fight show, all this type of bollocks. <laughs> it took forever. That's, mate, it was crazy, right? That for me is not the way that you save boxing and push boxing forward. What you do is you give people exciting main events with competitive undercards and maybe invest a bit of education into some of these athletes, into how they go about growing their own social media and their own following. Yeah, yeah. MMA stars, we see them with the podcasts. They're brilliant on social media. They've got their leverage in their own audiences. And I think that's the way that boxing should uh, be going forward. And regarding these type of crossover fights, I don't think this is the end. I think Francis has just poured petrol all over the fire. Oh, gosh. He? He's absolutely just opened the floodgates and everybody's going to want a piece of it. So... On the production thing, listen, I get it. You know, they wanted to do something special. They invested a tremendous amount of money, as you said. They threw, flew in every legend of the fight game, celebrities galore, Kanye West, Eminem. Hey, I never saw Eminem smiling once. He looked, I'm the biggest Eminem fan. He yeah. had a face like a slapped ass the Man. whole time. You How much does I mean? it cost to get Eminem to a fight? A significant I, amount of money. I'm not it's even performed. Yeah, he didn't perform, did he? Oh my god! No, no. no. Um, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so like the halftime, well, not the halftime show, the the concert beforehand, and all the rest of it. I started a live on my YouTube channel, right, and and I timed it for what I thought would be half an hour before the main event, right. It ended up being a four hour and 15 minute stream, right? And after like 45 <laughs> minutes into it, I'm telling you, I was on there for four and a half hours almost. It drove me fucking wild because it's just me. I'm dying for a piss. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and then after a while, it cuts to Tyson Fury and he's only just getting his hands wrapped. The co main event had finished ages ago. And I'm like, what oh, is no. going on? As I said, listen, it was a spectacle. It was a yeah. show. I'm sure people had a great time and uh, it was a great experience for everyone that went to Saudi Arabia. But let's get the show on the road a little bit. Indeed, man. Indeed. Like I said, boxing just needs to concentrate on putting the best against the best a lot more often and i think that will hopefully then bring people uh, back back towards the back towards the sport harrington are you there sir uh i am but my mic situation is not that great for this it's episode. fucking terrible yeah <laughs> holy hell where are you, you <laughs> uh, hold on do you know where he is adam He's in the studio. <laughs> We're at home We're in our home. bunkers. We're in our tool sheds. You're in the studio and you sound and look like shit. <laughs> oh, I mean, I can't change the way I look, Michael. That's just that's that's an unfortunate thing I was born with. But um, yeah, well, no. Talking about the light situation. That's all, brother. I'm not talking about, you know what I mean? Your healthiness. I'm not talking about your BMI. You get a little ring light on you, brother. You're in a studio. Nah, I had one earlier. My computer died. It's a whole to do. What can I help I'm you joking, with? I'm joking. Not much. <laughs> seeing, seeing as we have the great Adam Catchell on here. Um, in fact, fuck off. We don't need you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, brother. I'm just joking, but I'm serious. Um, I'm off to Brazil tomorrow. Then from there, I go straight up to NYC, yes. New York oh. City, the Big Apple. Adam Catchell's going to be there. That's it. Be Anthony Lionheart Smith. Oh, yeah, there. me too. Tom Aspinall, we couldn't let you go. And are you good for a bit of time? You want to do the show with us, Adam? No, yeah, I'll kick back with you. No bother. Let's oh, do it. There we um, go. Thoughts on the momentous opportunity for Tom Aspinall next week? Obviously, we went through it at length last week, but I'd love to get your take. Mate, first and foremost, absolutely gutted for John. Uh, and Stipe in particular, because I know that they put a lot of work in the camps and stuff to get that fight on for that main event, 30th anniversary show. A lot of fight fans were str extremely excited about it. You know, you've got the greatest of all time for many people taking on the best heavyweight. It's a shame that that fight's not happening. But when, you know, one door shuts for somebody, a door opens for somebody else, doesn't it? And when I actually take a step back and think about the fight that they've replaced it with, when you think of elite level heavyweight, martial arts it doesn't get better than this Sergei Pavlovich against Tom Aspinall it's it's such a razor thin close fight one mistake and it's lights out for either dude both guys have got great hands knockout power we haven't seen Pavlovich use it in the in the UFC but we know that he's got a decent wrestling base 
Tom's got that great grappler. They can finish in multiple ways. I'm actually more intrigued by this than I was the original main event. I know that sounds absolutely batshit crazy, but we're maybe biased. it's because it's yeah, maybe it is we're because bi- the biased. British environment. Maybe maybe it is, mate. But it's a phenomenal, phenomenal fight. I, I think I have a little bit of bias as well. I think I'm the I'm the honorary Brit these days. Yes, I, I honestly think that. I don't think it's that as long as Tom doesn't get caught, I don't think it's super competitive. I really don't. I think Tom's just wow. that much better all the way around. I think that he's, he fights smarter. Pavlovich kind of tends to lumber around a little bit and, and relies on his durability because he, the dude can take a shot for sure. But um, I, I think Tom is too smart. He's too diverse. He has too many ways to win to, to get into a firefight like that. So I think as long as he makes a smart decision and, and decides to grapple gets i think one takedown and and tom goes home with that belt oh, um mate and guess I, what guess what yeah anthony anthony sunday we're having brunch beer <laughs> in new york City. <laughs> by the way anthony you're bring aware that of up. the term you're bring, the, you're aware of the up. term brunch right right yeah yeah so i'm flying back new york city sunday i'm figuring out my flight home the options are 7 a.m that's out the window the other option is 1 p.m the other option is 6 p.m so i just messaged the the the, the tnt sport group i'm like what time are you guys all flying back because if you're around let's do some brunch beers let's have a bit of brunch (laughs) and have a few beers and they all came back with brunch what the (laughs) are you talking about you americanized (laughs) <laughs> exactly. This is it. Anthony, this motherfucker is from Clitheroe, right? Uh, this, this is not how we talk around here. This is not how we talk. Bro, man, I've been in California, man. Um, I've never heard anybody call it brunch beers, though. Oh, we're having yeah. brunch beers, bacon and eggs, pints of Stella, just like we did last time we were there. But the reason I bring this up, Anthony, is because he doesn't know it yet. Well, we kind of does. We've, we've, we've floated the idea. Tom Aspinall's joining us. He's His coming. dad's joining us. He's bringing the f-ing belts when he wins. And, he's f-ing and buying. you're coming as well. And he, as long as Tom's buying, if he's got a, <laughs> if he has a belt with him and he's not buying, Tom and I are no longer friends. Well, Adam's from Blab and I'm from Clitheroe, very close. Tom's from Atherton, very close. Yeah. You yeah. got to remember, champion or not, he's from Atherton. He, he's cheaper. <laughs> he's, he's cheaper. cheaper. Well, Huh? He could peel an orange in his pocket. Do you know what I mean? He's, <laughs> he's not like getting his hand, his wallet out. <laughs> oh dear! Why right, this episode is sponsored by the Manscaped Beard Hedger Pro Kit. Listen, if you're a man, if you've got a beard, if you want it groomed and you want the best quality beard hedger on the market, then look no further than the Manscaped Beard Hedger Pro Kit. And we're going to give you twenty percent off when you go to manscaped.com and use the promo code. Bisping 20, you get 20% off and you also get free shipping. So it starts off with the Beard Hedger Pro. This thing is the best beard trimmer you'll find. First off, it's waterproof. All Manscaped products are fantastic quality. It's a cordless trimmer that has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 different lengths, so no need for loads of attachments cluttering up your drawer. It has a titanium-coated T-blade, tough on hair, smooth on your face. But the Pro Kit is much more than a trimmer. It comes with four dermatologist-tested formulations for your post-trim care. It has the beard shampoo and conditioner because all hair is different. It has the shampoo and conditioner specially designed to moisturize, reduce in hairs, and replenish your natural oils. Plus, it comes with a beard oil. The nutrient-infused oil relieves dryness both on the beard and on the skin beneath. And then you cap it off with the beard balm, a pomade that shapes, styles, and moisturizes, whilst giving off the amazing scents of eucalyptus, rosemary, and lavender. Also, we're not done there. The Beard Hedger Pro Kit comes with three free gifts, a beard brush, a comb and scissors so your beard is always ready to impress. So if you've got a beard, step your game up. Head yourself over to manscaped.com. Use the code BISPING20. You're going to get 20% off and free shipping. Harrington, give us a non-MMA story then. Let's see what he comes up with. All Let's see right. what he comes up with. Oh, that it sounds better. My audio sounds a little better. All right, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm producing on the fly, baby. Um, Okay, let's see here. I We're mean, only an hour in. I don't know yeah, if I call I that on the fly. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, <laughs> dude, I feel like spirit. Uh, yeah, we're an hour in and we were late because sadly uh, Brian can't join us on this one. Hopefully he arrives a little bit later. So we pushed it back and we pushed it back. Adam's been waiting for hours, an hour into the show. And all he had to do was press microphone selection. It's okay. It. It's all right. You're learning. <laughs> all, right. Um, all right. So I got a couple of sad ones at the top that I think I'm going to skip through. But um, this one I thought was interesting. Uh, how long would you guys live in a certain place per day if you were getting ten thousand dollars a day? Wow. Um, What's the certain place? Yeah, what kind of place? A grocery store. I'd live there forever. Forever. You eat. I'd order Uber Eats galore. You know what? In this modern day and age, a ten thousand day a pop. I mean, listen, you want to get out there and you want to feel the fresh air on your face. You want to see the beautiful sights, the seven wonders of the world. But there's also a lot of facilities and a lot of things that can get dropped off to you on this day and age, whether that be drugs, alcohol, food, <laughs> women, right? The list goes on. Amazon will bring you anything. You want paper clips? They'll have them in an hour. You want a printer? It's there. You want a pair of shoes? You want Harrington? Dressed up like Sam Smith. Harrington dressed up as Sam Smith. That's oh, what you should it. do for Halloween, right? Twerking all over the place. We can have that delivered. Ten grand a day. Ten How grand a day. How could you do, Adam? I'd, I'd li- I would live. I would risk living with Jeffrey Dahmer for fucking ten thousand. Fucking. <laughs> I'm pretty fucking tough. I mean, I feel like I could fight him off for at least. Then get my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I got five days in me for sure with Jeffrey. That's Dahmer. the best I- line you've ever come out with, Anthony. That's hilarious. Ten thousand dollars a day. Oh my god! I've been in worse places for free. Oh god! Did, have you have you seen the um? I don't know if you've seen this story. This is kind of connected to this. That Anthony Joshua went on one of those little retreats. That's right, like a li- sensory out. deprivation yeah. retreat. He lived in a shed, like a dark shed, nothing going on. Um, I think he did four days, something like that. Absolutely nothing, nobody around him, just him in a dark room for four days. Which is- I, I tried a sensory deprivation tank. There was no changes. They're like, this has got no sense. <laughs> <laughs> it was the status quo. I'm like, I thought it was a sensory deprivation tank. That's how you're living in your life, Bispin. Oh, dear. I thought Harrington was going to bring up because he's got it number one story. And it was sad. Listen, it, it is, it's really sad. It's really sad. But it's probably not pe- what people want to talk about on an MMA show. But Chandler... From May. friends. May. Oh, yeah. I was so shocked when I saw that. I'm a, I wouldn't say too. my heart was broken because sadly people pass away every day. But that was so surprising and very sad. I think we all grew up watching Friends, right? Well, that's it. You've got an emotional connection to it because it's part of your childhood. I think any any person that you used to watch on a regular basis or, you know, whether they're a pop star that you idolized or a sports star or something like that when, when, when they're no longer around. And especially, what was he, 54? That's 54. Yeah, he's that's, young. That's young, man. 54 years of age. You, you, in your head, he's he's consistently this guy that's telling jokes, always happy, always fun, or, or, or that type of human being. And to see somebody go out at 54 years of age with all the struggles that he's had off camera, very well documented stuff that he that he's gone through. It's it's heartbreaking, mate. Because we're all we're all of a, a not 54, but we're all of an age that again, you know. In, in a decade's time, we'll be we'll be Hold in on. that remit, so you can see it a bit. You know what I mean? Am I the oldest here? How old are you? I'm for, forty-two. Prick. I'm just thirty-four. I'm thirty-five. Young guy. Jesus Christ. See? Jesus. Just, um, I think the circumstances of of him dying is it, it feels gross. Makes it feel gross too. Of course. Like drowning in your own hot tub, probably super fucked up. Like that yeah. sucks. Depressing. Well, that was the thing, yeah. wasn't it? Because, I mean, it's well documented that he had a long struggle with alcohol and substance abuse, opioids yeah. in particular. Mm-hmm. And Adam, living in the UK, you're probably not as familiar. I mean, I know we have our problems for sure. Anytime I say this, if people always think that I'm trying to de- uh, illustrate the UK is better. They're just different places. We have just as many problems in the UK as the States, mm-hmm. you know, but we didn't have an opioid crisis. And in fact, I was listening to the Rogan podcast driving to Vegas last week, and I wasn't aware of this. America was the only country on the planet 
that had an opioid crisis um, because the doctors went out there, they lied to everybody. And I'm sure that's a big part of the reason why, um, sorry, what's it? Matthew Perry, right? Is it Matthew yeah. Perry? Yeah. Yeah. Matthew yeah, yeah. Perry found himself. I always know him as Chandler. Matthew Perry kind of found himself in this situation. So many people lost their lives. Stefan Bonner, who passed away recently, I'm sure that was a big part of it. I'll yeah. be honest, I've, I've had my issues with the amount of surgeries that I've had. And when I came out here, first thing they were doing was throwing me a prescription for 120 Percocet. That stuff blows your goddamn mind up and it's truly addictive. I had to flush mine down the toilets eventually because I'm like, I'm done with this shit. I'm not taking this anymore. Um, you know, so you got a guy there, you know, and I'm not making excuses for him, but I'm sure that was a big, big part of it. Of course, he's very famous. Doctors, if you've got fame, if you've got wealth, you know what I mean? You can have, you will get taken care of better than the average guy that maybe works down a factory. You know what I mean? Look at Michael Jackson for crying out loud, the shit that yeah. they were giving him. Um, it's just really, really sad. But you know, yeah. I, I, ha I had a very similar struggle with, with the painkillers because of all the surgeries, it's not even something I was doing on, you know, on purpose because I was trying to have fun. It's you find yourself still taking it and you're like, Oh, I, I don't even hurt. I'm just doing it because that's what I've been doing for a little while. It and it happens really fast. I mean, it uh, feels good. A couple days. Okay. I mean, you can start feeling in a couple of days. Like I don't, I, I don't really feel that much pain, but I don't want to stop taking it. So like, you'll have to tell yourself like, all right, I got to give them to my wife. Like, here, get rid of these. Mm. Cause I've three or four days in now. And like, don't I'm starting to, to feel, wife. I'm, I'm starting to feel, <laughs> I'm starting to feel she fucking weird. Hoarding right them now. away. <laughs> but when I'm in Brazil, <laughs> right. you can take them all. Uh, have you guys ever seen the documentary on Netflix? It was called, uh, it's called dope sick. I believe. Um, started watch started no that was on HBO I think dope sick but then there was what was the one on Netflix? painkiller there was I don't remember what it was but there was one on Netflix and it and it kind of it, it detailed though that this whole opioid crisis and why it happened and it was started with the pharmaceutical companies to start sending these reps to doctors offices and selling them on these meds they started getting them kickbacks this isn't addictive start using this uh, for mild moderate pain like it doesn't have to be severe pain. And then next thing you know, the, the the U.S. is in this absolute crisis where everyone's addicted. They're everywhere. You know, it's, it's a it's a fucking disaster. And it, but it happens, like you said, Mike. It, you get a couple surgeries. It's pretty quick. It's easy. To Adam, do. Adam, I'd lived out here for many years. So I'd been a pro fighter in the U.K. many years, pretty much my entire life. Really talking about amateur martial arts. Came out to the states. Got a little twinge on my knee. Before I know it, I've got a prescription for Percocet. And not long after that, I went under the knife and they started doing surgeries. Now, probably the surgeries were needed, but it's the, it's the pills. Do you know what mm. I mean? My God, it's bad. It really is. And you know what else I heard on that podcast with Rogan? And this will blow my mind. When I first started coming out here to America, like when I was in the Pali station auditioning for the Ultimate Fighter and stuff, you're fl flicking through the TV and you got all the adverts for all the drugs. You know what I mean? And like for whatever the medication is and it shows a bunch of people all happy and smiley and like, oh my God, I've been taking this thing. Just ask your doctor for it. And the problem isn't even bad, but the side effects will kill you. May, may cause <laughs> uh, blurry headed, uh, loss of vision, constipation, uh, extreme weight loss and death. Just <laughs> internal bleeding. You're like, this well, was maybe for... maybe don't take that. But <laughs> for just, headaches. I, I, as I said, I, I never... Yeah, I've just got a fucking hangover, mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to die. I'll, I'll just sit this one out. I'll lie on the couch and drink some fucking orange juice. Um, okay. Rogan was saying this, and I never knew this. I was unaware. There's only the States and New Zealand on the planet where you can advertise drugs on TV. Really? Yeah. Because we so don't like, have that in the UK. The I UK mean, like real pharmaceutical like, drugs. The UK doesn't have like, I don't no. know, Prozac commercials? No. 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 See, that's crazy. That's weird. I've been, as far as I can remember, that's what I just painkiller commercials and mm. uh, antidepressants and all sorts of commercials on TV. It's just we'll have we'll have something as soft as like a Nurofen, maybe. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. like an Advil. Yeah, yeah, as as soft as that, but that's as that's as strong as it'll get on on. It British TV. That's wild. It legit says on the commercials, if you're suffering from this, speak to your doctor about this. And of course, that's what they want. You go to your doctor. In the UK, you can't go to the doctor and say, so uh, this is this drug, and it's a name you can't even pronounce. I want to yeah. try that. And the doctor goes, yeah, sure, straight away. Boom, there you go. It's wild. Anyway, Adam doesn't want to talk about this. Harrington, throw an MMA story at us, please. <laughs>
You, or do you want to talk about it? Mate, no. This is your Adam, show. Oh, I'm getting, Adam, no, Adam wants to get in depth on the opioid no, crisis. I'm good. I'm good. Riddled I'm the good. United States of America. <laughs> maybe riddled me. Uh, Hamilton, it was a joke. Get yourself back on the screen, brother. Jesus, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. Um, so we got an update on Hamzad Chimaev. Uh, so apparently the, the, the break that he was feeling uh, when he left the octagon uh, was in fact a torn ligament. Uh, his manager says he's going to be wearing a cast on his hand for four weeks, and they're going to reevaluate. He believes they're going to be able to avoid surgery. Excellent. So you guys talk amongst yourselves because I'm dying for a piece. So you just chatted out like two skinheads at a bus stop. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what do what you is- want to see him do next? Yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't know because, you know, I've talked about this and I've got I've gotten quite a bit of shit for it, but I'd like to see Hamza fight another top contender first. Not because I don't think he can win the title now, because I, I think he has all the skills and abilities to beat a guy with the style of Sean Strickland. He also... Yeah we've seen has the ability to lose to a guy like Sean Strickland. If he can't get Sean Strickland out of there early. Um, I think, I think a five round, uh, a five round arena for a guy like Hamza right now is, is really unsteady territory right now. I, I, I think that two, two more rounds with Usman potentially could look very different. Yeah. I think uh, uh, two more rounds with a guy like Gilbert Burns, I think potentially could have went very, very different. So I only say this because I have a lot of belief in Hamza and in his, what I know, I know where I believe his ceiling is. I think that he's got some checks and balances he needs to do in a couple places before we start to try to uh, climb that, that world champion mountain, because even if he goes in there, he, maybe he finishes Strickland early. That's absolutely possible. But then what? Yeah. Then you got, you you got Duplessis, you got Whitaker floating around out there. You got uh, g- guys that are that are very uh, capable in, in at the highest level in five round atmosphere. So I think he needs to shore up maybe some of the conditioning or, or pacing issues. Um, but it, it's going to be hard to deny him. Uh, the only other, and this is only because I don't quite understand. I know that a lot of those guys have not been in the states recently. And I don't know what the reason for that is. Mm-hmm. So I think like Ankalaev and and, and Hamza and I, I don't know if there's travel travel issues happening right now. I think that yes. that would put a, a roadblock in 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 their way potentially. Hmm. Would you rematch him with Usman straight away, Mike? Hamza. Yeah. <sighs> I see the show still going. I hope everyone didn't j- decide to log off just because I left for a second. And in fact, the show probably got better without my stupid rambling. So well done, lads. Um, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I think I think what we've just seen that. Well, we've just seen that fight. And I thought Usman did himself proud. Hamza showed to the world. And as a big Hamza fan, I hesitate to say this, but he showed that, yes, he is great. He is skilled. He does show the potential to be a future world champion and be very dominant as a champion. And the fight with Strickland apparently is going to go ahead from what we're seeing online because because it's not a hand break. So that would, number one, that would put the Kamaru Usman rematch on the back burner. But I think he has issues with his cardio. I think he needs to sort that out. We were talking about this last show saying, listen, yeah, he needs to pace himself. I said, no, he should be able to go balls to the wall for three, five minute rounds. I think Hamzat now has earned the right to fight Sean Strickland, even Drickus Duplessis came out just recently. I read an article today where he was saying, and i got to say, I really respect Drickus for this. He said, listen, life moves on. Life's tough. It's not always fair. He said, I was number one contender. Now I'm not. So what? He said, I'll fight anybody and everybody that I have to do to earn that shot again. Is that real? Is that real or is that... Because you know how it goes. Sometimes we say it things. In quotation marks. Yeah. Sometimes we play the game a little bit. Like because if Hamzat doesn't fight Strickland, he probably fights Duplessis. So I feel like saying, ah, yeah, that's probably his spot. Let's let's see him some more at 185. Let's see him up against Strickland. Let's see if we we got any holes we can take advantage of. Versus well, what would you? L- uh, well, if I'm Duplessis, I'm probably not wanting to. F- if I can fight someone not named Hamza and still keep my number one contender spot after that fight, uh, that's probably what I do. Adam, um, for me, gents, Drikus Duplessis proved to me that he's ready for the title shot. 
he did that against Robert Whittaker. So I agree. If, I, if, I, mm. if I'm running the yeah. gaff, Drikis Duplessis gets the title shot against Sean Strickland. I think that's the, the, the fight to make. From a Hamza Shumayev point of view, I come away from that fight thinking Kamara Usman on very short notice just showed just how good he is. Even at 185, I know he wants, still wants to float between that and 170, but he just showed how good he is. I would love to see Usman full camp at 185, have a go at that because I agree with what Anthony just said there. I think another two rounds in the fight that we've just witnessed on uh, Abu Dhabi, I think Kamari Usman takes that fight and he takes that fight. He might even have stopped him because I thought uh, Hamzat was gassing seriously at the end of uh, end of the third. There's also Robert Whittaker in that mix as well. Robert Whittaker and Hamzat Chumayev. That's a fight to Robert make. Robert Whittaker, Kamari Usman. That should absolutely. be Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Love that. Love can, that you do the, can you do a South African accent, Adam? I could have a go, mate. Have a go, mate, because right there, you'll see it you right to, there. It, it, is this, it, is it, this Drikus? This, this is Drikus, and give okay. us your best Drikus, please. Mine's listen, pretty good. It's <laughs> awful. Listen, if anybody comes at me now and tries to cancel me off the back of this, I'm going to blame Michael Bisping. All right? Right. That's but what... read the statement from okay. Drikus, yeah? Okay. When you look at this, I have one or two options. <laughs> the first thing... I can say is a little bit of a jab is Hamzat's hand is broken, right? <laughs> so he should be ready to fight in seven weeks or he forfeits his total shot <laughs> because that's what happened to me. I wasn't ready to fight in seven weeks time. I'm getting, I'm going a little bit Australian here. I apologize. It's all right. That's pretty good. <laughs> to almost stop feeling sorry for myself like this is unfair. Life's not fair. And the fourth game is definitely not fair. I just said that I'll... What's that, that last bit there? I can't read that. I just I said what I'll do when I am fit. There you go. So... It's pretty mate, good. That's pretty, pretty good. bloody good. That's pretty I'll good. Say, I'll say, Drickers title shot, man. Don't be so nice, Drickers. This is the thing. Closed mouths do not get fed. Don't be so nice. Say, no, bullshit. I'm the guy. I beat Robert Whittaker. I'm number one. Give me the title shot. Correct, Amondo. But also, shit happens. Life's tough. Get a helmet. You know what I mean? Crack on. <laughs> knock someone out. Get a baseball bat. Ram it over someone's head and demand that title fight the way that he did knocking out Robert Whittaker. Now, yeah. life isn't fair, okay? And the UFC isn't always... Well, life, sports isn't fair, should I say. Conor McGregor, did you see what he said last week? He huh. said, I've been kept from my living for three years now. Understand yes. that. I came through what I came through. I'm sitting on an injury and the loss. Imagine what that does. You hear what Alexander Volkanovsky said. I relate. I must return to my way of living. Gave it one of them. This is my job. So it's beyond frustrating. I just want the date. My date. Please. I have thoughts. I will kick it to the panel. I will kick it to the panel. Yeah, I'm trying to, <laughs> like, I'm trying to think of which way to take this, Mike. But the minute he came out of the new sort of testing pool and got juiced up majorly, he had an injury. You can't then start bitching and go, I haven't had a date. <laughs> I've been kept Adam, from my living. I'll kick it I'm, to the panel. I, I hope that he's pinching pennies and really getting his burn rate down a little bit. <sighs> Lamborghini sorry, Jets. I'm sorry you got injured. I don't want anybody to get hurt. You pulled yourself out of the testing pool. That's it is what it is. That's your finish fault. Finish it with kick it, kick it to Adam. And I'll kick, kick it to it the to panel. <laughs> you I'm you a it. sitting little bitch over there, Mister Catchall. I never thought. No, I'd man. Say those words. Listen, I'm just no. I'm just listening to you two. I actually saw Connor talking that, and it confuses me. It, the, the whole thing confuses me, the the conversation, the narrative. Everybody knows what happened. Everybody knows, and I don't think anybody begrudges. When you have a, an injury like that, nobody begrudges anybody taking care of yourself to make sure you can yep. walk again and get yourself full fit. Do what you need to do. I've always said that. Yep. Do what you need to do. But then when you want to get back into competition, do what every other athlete does. You enter the pool, you go through the right protocols, and then you can get yourself back in back in the game. Now, we're led to believe that's what he's done now, hasn't he? So I don't understand what the conversation is anymore. We're back in the game. We've got a period of time until he's going to be okay and give him the thumbs up. Then you'll get your date and then we'll rock and roll. Listen, it's going to happen, isn't it? February, March, April, sometime next year, of whenever he's allowed to do his thing, he'll be back in the game. But regarding him being kept from the craft, okay, from a psychological point of view, I understand it. He's a fighting man. He wants to fight. I get that. But from a financial point of view, I think he's okay. 
I think, well, I, think, I, think, I, think I, I hope so. Good. I mean, if he needs, here's here's. And you land I, I don't, I, no. I, 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 I'll throw him one. I'll throw him one. He, I think he's okay. Uh, I I don't want to rehash all the stuff that we already got into it with with Connor. Me and Mike are just we were the receivers of his verbal bullets. But the my whole issue the whole time was I just didn't know we could do that. I would have loved to jump out of the pool and do whatever I had to do to get healthy. Was that never said, nobody said that that you could do that no. like for example from, from we didn't from, know that was possible like from um chris weidman point of view for example i've he had, that's he had, that's been my very whole point thing. that's been my whole point is it poor chris weidman has had surgery after surgery after infection after yeah. failure there's no you, you mean to tell me that there's not a lot of things chris weidman could have taken advantage of he was he was out three years anyways just from the injury so there's not a lot and that of should have been the priority. The, the, the health is right. the priority. At the end of the day, go away from fighting. Do whatever right. you need to do. Go and be. We just didn't know a... that was an option. We now, didn't hold know that on, was a though. fucking thing. Now, now, hold on. Playing devil's advocate, though, and, and, oh, and it's fair. Go. No, 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 but it's true, though, because you, you've got to look at both sides of it, right? And, and I understand what you're saying, and Chris Wyman, that might have been the best course of action for him. Sounds like it would have been, right, without question. Same for yourself. Anderson mm -hmm. Silva, who knows, maybe he did do that. We know he had issues when he came back and he started popping. Right. For Chris Wyman, or even yourself, we got to look at this, right? McGregor, obviously, with his, his wealth that he has, I'm sure he has access to the very best doctors. To be fair, it would be doctors that typically the UFC would – direct him to, to war, towards or maybe he has his own paradigm sports management audience are they know all the big players in the nfl basketball etc so maybe right. they went to some specialist right mm -hmm. that was probably a doctor that said you need to take x y and z of course to get back mm -hmm. to where you were so if you weren't informed if weidman wasn't informed then that's it's 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 <sighs> I'm saying, I, it's not I, 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 saying it's not I, I McGregor's fault. Well, I have. No, I don't think it is. No, I, I, I've been in situations where they're like, this could help you heal faster. We could deal with this, this, and this. And I've always had to say, I can't. I can't take, look, look at this fucking list. I can't take it. Like, it's on this list of banned substances. I can't take it. They're like, well, this is a normal pharmaceutical drug that we give to average people all the time. Well, it's a, it's considered a performance enhancer. I can't take it. And then we just move on. I think if could you not have were... a conversation at the time then to say, listen, I'm, I'm talking now back with the UFC to then say, listen, guys, <laughs> my legs fucked. I need to do this. I'm coming out the pool to do X, Y, and Z. And then once I'm fit and healthy, I'll go right. through the proper protocols and get back into the pool. Well, I just don't think anybody knew that that was an option. I think you, you get the list, you see everything that's illegal, and you're like, okay. all right, well, I can't take that. We just move on and just try something else. Um, again, I'm not even – I don't think I've ever faulted Connor for doing that. I think that the – the uh, the I don't know, the, the secret part of it, how it's – very quiet and, and kind of under the rug a little bit and then nobody talks about it and i i think it would have helped a lot of people if he would have said listen my, my leg was and i had and he did in ways he just wasn't super clear about it just say like there's some things on that list that really would help a lot of us mm. heal faster heal better without giving us any performance enhancing uh performance enhancing effects long term so maybe you know i'm going to pull myself out so that i'm not you know i'm not failing or i'm not doing something that everyone else that's actively competing are, are allowed to do let me get myself healthy and and then i'll come back when i'm when i'm good i'll do all the right protocols i'll sit out for six months i'll give the clean test and then mm -hmm. I'll, i i think a lot of us would have been like oh okay that makes sense you know, like well, I don't have anything to say, but it was like the the snake and around that was weird about it, and that no one actually knew until some internet sleuth happened to figure out that Connor hadn't been tested in like ten months or something. They're like, well, that's weird. How come? Then they say, but well, that's a big thing, people. is it? Like, it, it is a big. It. it is it. Well, well. Uh, to be fair, again, I, I, I'm not here to s sit and defend Connor McGregor. Far from it. Do you know what I mean? We all know that. I don't. Well, maybe exactly, that's none of our fucking. I'm business not the biggest either. fan. No, but that's what I was going to say. It's nobody else's. It's nobody. Nobody else needs to know about your private health. You know what I mean? You're, that's that's one of the most sensitive, confidential matters on planet Earth. Your doctor will be sued 
for sharing that mm-hmm. with other people. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's not for him to get online and be like, hey, everyone, I'm coming out the testing pool. Mind your own fucking business. I'm dealing with an injury. I don't mean you. I mean one. Right. You know, right. so, yeah, I mean, like, right. word on the street is, according to the internet sleuths, is that TJ Dillashaw is probably doing the same thing right now. You know what I mean? And again, and and maybe this creates this loophole where people start doing this now. You know what I'm saying? But again, you're taking time out of the testing pool. Then you've got to come back. Then you've got to do six months. Mm-hmm. You're taking time away from your prime earnings as well. So I guess there's a give and a take, you know, because we For don't sure. know how good Conor is going to be when he comes back. If he does come back and beat Michael Chandler and then go on and fight Smakachev like DC wants, which probably will happen, God bless it. But so far, the track record has shown when people come back with those leg breaks, the future's not bright. No. The future has not been orange, you know? That's fair. All right, guys, I want to tell you about Kachava, which is one of our new sponsors. And I am telling you, this supplement, this super blend of super foods and greens and proteins and everything that you need for your body is amazing. Listen, long gone are the days now where you have to go in and you're going to have a protein powder, you're going to have your super greens, you're going to have your probiotics, your adaptogens, your antioxidants. Kachava has blended it all together in one. It gives you everything that your body craves and you will feel your absolute best. And the good thing is they are delicious. They are absolutely beautiful. It's creamy, smooth, and it comes in five delicious flavors. They've got the chocolate, the vanilla, the chai, the matcha, and the coconut as i.e. Listen, as I said, you know, before you had to have your protein, well, this has 25 grams of plant protein per serving. And as I said, it's got the superfoods, it's got the greens, the proteins, the antioxidants, the adaptogens, and the probiotics. And let me tell you, you feel fantastic after this. I'm really noticing a difference in my uh, recovery from lifting weights. It's really helping with the protein synthesis. You feel great afterwards. You are energized throughout the day. I'm going to the bathroom nice and regularly, and it looks good when it's coming out. Anyway, moving on from that because it's disgusting, but this stuff is fantastic. Get it all in one. Get all the goodness and all the vitamins, minerals, proteins that your body needs in one little scoop of Kachava, and you can get 10% off for a limited time. So right now, go to kachava.com, K-A-C-H-A-V-A, kachava.com, slash believe. You'll get 10% off your first order, kachava.com, slash believe. Leon Edwards, he's fighting uh, Colby Covington. Mm-hmm. Have you seen the news? You, we all know Ian Gary, the welterweight sensation, the phenom, mm-hmm. the future. Goes up and does a bit of training now and again with Leon Edwards. What's it called? Renegade MMA or something? Yeah. Renegade. Ian Gary is banned from Renegade. He's been kicked out of the gym. He's been sent on his merry way. Harrington, give us the quote. You yeah, don't know this, happening? Adam. No, I'm not. I'm not saying it. Is this today? This is drama. This on, is internal drama, gym drama. And it's I want to know your again. take, uh, Adam, and I want to know yours, Anthony, because obviously you train with a lot of teammates. I never trained with someone that was in my weight class, but Harrington, give us the quote, please, a bit of context. Thousands of tears later. So... Ian Gary claims he's been asked to leave Leon Edwards' gym because the champion doesn't want to have any securities or doubts. Here's the quote. Leon and his head coach had an issue with me training on the mats and recently asked me not to train there because Leon doesn't want any insecurities or doubts on his own mats within the gym, which I don't fully understand, said Ian. I get that we're both in the top 10 and you might see me as a threat, but I'm not a threat to you right now. I'm not fighting for the title right now. His coach said the words, Ian is a threat. I cannot have Leon having any doubts or insecurities. This makes me think someone is weak-minded and can't have another contender training on the mat. That's why gym conflict is annoying. For me, why not have the other elite guy on the mat? Why not train with him? Why not have him push you? Why not learn and grow from each other? Adam Catchell thoughts. Then we'll get the analyst. We'll get the, we'll get the casual. We'll get the pro. They're trained together Sorry. before, aren't they? I'm sure he's been in Renegade on a few... For years. Yeah, I'm sure uh, Ian's been in Renegade before and, and they've trained together. I mean, I can't believe that. Knowing Leon as I do, I can't believe that he's booted somebody out of the gym. I'm, so, good... I'm so glad you said that. There's, there's, there's so many because good guys some in some rumblings that... around. Okay. That... <laughs> Look, the fight, the fight game is small. All fighters talk to all fighters. I don't even hang out with fighters. 
but I'm in a couple group texts with a bunch of them and word is, and I won't say who said it or whatever, but word is, is Ian Gary is struggling to find somewhere to train at all, which makes kind of sense that he was even there to begin with because what happened to, um, Killcliffe? Killcliffe? I don't know. What did, is he not there anymore? Doesn't sound like it. So it sounds like he's headed to Brazil right now. Well, the, the Killcliffe situation, I can understand because Luke is there, isn't he? So and Shabka, obviously, yeah, Shabka. but he's fighting Luke. That, I like I like Ian Gary. I really do. Yeah, it's just, I do. I I feel like there's something funny going on. You know what I mean? I, I he's just been in Iceland, hasn't he? At Gunny's gym, I think he's been up there doing a bit of training. I, I just going back to your original point, Mike. Like he's I bouncing around believe, a little bit, and, it, and I don't know why. I cannot believe that Leon Edwards will kick anybody off the gym. In fact, I genuinely believe Leon Edwards is the type of character to welcome elite level training. In order so, to keep him sharp, I've had one conversation and, with Leon in my whole life. He seems like he's he's kind of too much of a gangster, like mentally, same. to give agree, a shit yeah. about that. Like I agree. Like yeah, I, I yeah, feel like so, he wants to lose every day in the gym. I if we take that statement at face value, right? Yeah. If we take it for what it is and we take it at face value, I mean, it is weird because you do want to train with the best people possible. And as we've all said, that doesn't sound like Leon Edwards. He's fighting Colby Coverton. One could say that maybe he's not a stylistic fit for Colby, whereas Leon is more of a stylistic fit for Vincente Luque. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so one could broach the opinion that Ian is gaining here where Leon isn't, but even still, you know what I mean? There's different matchups all the time down the line and you pay good money. You fly people in from other countries. You pay for their flights, their hotels. If That's you're going to have one of the top about. contenders come to your gym for free, put their own petrol in the car to get there, you know, and you're going to say, no, don't train. You know how many flights, know. hotels, week per diems, rental cars, like how much money I've paid in trying to find the best available training partner to get them to my gym so that I can lose to them every single day just to get better. You had a free one right there so, and you asked him to leave. I find that hard to believe. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it doesn't make sense. That's for sure. I, so I won't ask you, Adam, because I don't want to put you in the situation, you know, because obviously, you know, Leon and you know, Ian, you know, but I will ask you, Anthony, because you did say it, you did allude to it. Are you saying that you are from your group messages? Are you saying that you don't buy this statement or or, or, or you think it's not Leon? It's, it's maybe it, on the side of Ian. I, Is that yeah, what you're alluding to? I, I don't get the vibe or, or get the indication that it's Leon. That's the problem. But he, he, I guess I'm going to answer your question with another question. Politician. What is, to, to both of you guys, what is your take on Ian Gary? And, and I'll give mine before I kind of pass it off. I think that every interaction I've had with Ian Gary has been extremely positive. I, I, I've really enjoyed my time around him. I've enjoyed the, the conversations we've had. I like his take on fighting and as a, as, as a whole. I, I, I like just watching him with his family. I think that that's a, it's very, for lack of a better word, it's really cute. Like, I think they have a really cool wholesome. dynamic. Um, I, I think it's a wholesome situation. But then I see him on these interviews and on the microphones, and and uh, I was really thrown off how he, how he treated Neil Magny that, that fight week. I, I was really kind of – I was turned off a little bit there. Like, he kind of took one of the good guys and took – something he said and twisted it into a way that made that guy seem like a real big piece of shit. And I know Neil Magny uh, intimately and, and that guy, you couldn't, you can't find a better guy. So I was a little bit turned off by that. And so then I kind of look at everything he says in, from that lens, I think. And I don't know. Uh, I don't know what it's doesn't, I don't know if it's working. I don't know if it's working and I don't know what he's trying to accomplish. Cause I really think that him, cameras off lights off behind behind the scenes i i think he's a really cool guy i i, I okay, don't so, like what i've seen lately though so so i'll go first adam then you give your take okay. um i think i agree with what you said you know about the family stuff that's beautiful of course i also think because you do know neil magni personally i think maybe that's skewing your opinion on him and because he's maybe. one of your friends that you're kind of insulted for him 
Because the reality is, Ian Gary's cocky as fuck. Of course he is. He's supposed to be. For He's sure. undefeated. Look at me. Look at look at Conor McGregor. Look at all these other fighters. I'm, you have a more humble style about you, Anthony. You always have done. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Unless it's time to fucking fight. You know my name yet? Right. Um, <laughs> you know, but 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 a lot of people do have that kind of style. He's young, dumb. He's full of cum. He's ready to go. He's undefeated. He's knocking people out. He's calling his shot, and we're talking about him. So I so I have no issue with how he carries himself. Regarding the the Neil Magny thing, I don't. Neil is a great guy. I don't know him like you know him. Of course, I've said hi a few times. I've spoken to him on fighter meetings. Ian Gary, I don't know him. I've met him a couple of times. Great interactions, very positive. Mm-hmm. Found him to be charming, funny, charismatic. He was there with his family. You know what mm-hmm. I mean. So again, you got to admire that. You got to respect that. Um, this is how he's promoting himself. This is how he's putting himself forward. This is why I was trying to get the biggest fights. We're here for a good time, not a long time, and try to maximize on the potential. Adam Catchell. I, I listen, Mike, I agree with what you just said there. I think closed mouths don't get fed, do they, in this game? You can have all the talent in mm. the world in the octagon and you can get to a certain level and then you can get overlooked, maybe because you don't sell or you you, you don't pop with the hierarchy or what have you. I think like Leon the- for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I think from a Ian Gary point of view, the, the, as Anthony was speaking there, I was just thinking this story about Leon. What's the what's what's the plus? If you piss off the champ, there's a high there's a high chance that the champ's gonna go, come on then, motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Let's do it, right? There's a high chance that that's gonna happen. Now Ian Gary's in this real good situation where if he's fighting Vincenzo Lucchi and he comes through that and he looks good, he could leapfrog a lot of lads here yeah. if he's pissed off the champ. And created this social media narrative. Maybe that's if, the point too. Maybe yeah. It point. Maybe it is the yeah. point. Maybe that's the whole reason why he's put that out there. Because if Leon comes through Colby, yeah, of course, there's some great contenders. We've mentioned Shavkat. We've mentioned these other people in this division that Leon probably should be fighting. But if he and Gary's making noise and generating numbers, then when the Chiefs are going to go, fuck it, a British mm-hmm. and Irish fight back in London in March? Go on then. Right. Go do it. I th- and, and maybe that is me just thinking, I think I've had so many positive interactions with him. I've seen all yeah. the cockiness and the arrogance and, you know, and I've thought the same thing as Mike, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I get it. I get it. It's a, it's a, it's a show a little bit, but then the, then the Neil Magny thing happened. And then I seen the, oh, well, Leon's afraid he uh, making it. They don't want his confidence shook. And I kept finding myself thinking, damn, I thought he was a good guy. <laughs> And 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 that's that's just me. That's probably just a me thing. Because I've seen yeah, all the but, other bullshit. But then the Neil thing and the Leon thing, I'm like, ah, I don't know. You're but you got to remember poking at a couple people I hold pretty high as far as their personalities and their and their I don't know their values. You know, you know, it's again, brother. Yeah, you know, yeah. I was, I, was, I was just about to say, but we're <laughs> two faces. I mean, a lot of the time I didn't. Yeah, I, I was always. <laughs> you were, you, no, you were always, always an, an asshole. asshole. <laughs> yeah, no, I was. I, I'll be honest. No, no, I'm serious. A lot of people they put on their promoter hats and they they have two personalities. You know what I mean? For me, it was always like, I'm, this guy's going to fight me. He's my enemy, and I would act like I, I did, and I would say things I regret now, and all the rest of it, and what call it what you will. But most people, most are intelligent enough that they have two versions of themselves you know Mm. for example prime example colby covington yeah and i i wasn't sold on that i didn't believe that this was an act i didn't believe that he was putting on a wwe-esque character until i had some run-ins with him when there was no cameras around and i was blown away by how humble how polite and what just generally a decent human being he was now you put a camera on him he throws on the maga hat and he's a big trump <laughs> supporter that's not an act but he's he's coming at everyone he's hot taking no prisoners he's pulling no punches you know what I'm saying? But you bump into the guy walking down the street and he's so nice. Yes, sir. No, sir. Helping people out, holding doors, very taking time with fans and all the rest of it. But you put a camera on him and he's pissing a lot of people off. Dude, so, Colby, Colby Covington one time went off on me on Twitter uh, when I was getting ready to fight John. Uh, he couldn't have been meaner. <laughs> it was so mean. <laughs> and then we see each other and he's real weird, doesn't say a whole lot. And then we see each other a couple months later. And it was, he held a door for me. How you doing, Mr. Smith? Uh, pats me on the back. Like, I was too shocked to even be mad. I was like, well, right. uh, I, okay, guess we're good. <laughs> Bro, Mike, so 
obviously we're about to head out for UFC 295, right? For in in New York. And if you remember, they did um the press conference for his Usman fight was at the BMF. So when it was uh Nate against Jorge, they did a backstage where it was all about uh Kamaru Usman versus Colby Covington. Colby was staying in our hotel. I saw him in the lobby that morning. What a conversation. Normal dude. We talked about NFL. We talked about all different aspects of stuff. Sweet as. Half an hour later, mate, I'm backstage interviewing him, fully suited up, <laughs> maggot up to the tits, going absolutely wild at me. And I'm like, like he's never met me before. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? The dude knows but that's great. Play the game. Yeah, of course. It takes a lot of intelligence as well to do that. <clears throat> Other than Colby, Adam. As as obviously you're an analyst and you're a commentator within the sport and a big, big fixture in the UK uh, production parts. And and by the way, working with you and, uh, and Nick, I absolutely love it. And I'm proud to be a part of the whole team. I'm serious, though. Ever since I started working with you guys, it was great because it's nice to still be involved with the UK broadcast. But that aside, all last kissing aside and shout out to the whole team. See you all in New York. Cannot wait for that. No one gives a f- They're not even watching. Um, outside of Colby. As, as also a fan of the sport, yeah. who's another one that stands out to you that does a good job of turning the sw- flipping the switch, changing character? And Anthony, have a think as well. Ooh. Characters. Because uh, McGregor's, the, the McGregor doesn't do a Colby. Mm-mm. No. 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 That's not I a mean, Colby Covington act. When, when Connor was Pete Connor, 2016, 2017, it was weird. Mate, it was like going to a stand-up comedy show. You yeah. used to sit there yeah. doing the interview. You used to interview him and just sit there and let him absolutely wax lyrical and, and be sensational. Regarding characters, Colby's the, obviously the standout one. Um, I can't think of too many that change it up on camera, off camera. I'll tell you who's really good at it that gets the WWE vibe a little bit. Michael Chandler. He gets, he, get, he gets that a little bit. I think there's a lot of authenticity still about him when he's doing it, but he does just crank it up a couple of dials when you're in a conversation with him and he, he knows how to talk in sound bites. I think that's key, isn't it? He knows how to talk in those 30 seconds to one minute pieces that are going to pop on social media. He's, he's become an expert at it. I, I don't yeah. think I've, I've ran into anybody. The only person I know that even reminds me of Colby at all is Chael. And yeah. Chael does that. Uh, he class. does that to this day. Like when we're getting ready to go on, his glasses are down at the tip of his nose. He's looking. He can't yeah. see his phone. <laughs> uh, I've never seen. I th- I thought I thought Michael had really big font on his phone. Chael's <laughs> is the only font on his phone that's bigger because <laughs> he Mine's can't pretty see. Pretty gigantic. Chael's is pretty big too. <laughs> If it's if it's a word that's got more than four letters in it, it's it's two sentences on this phone. It's hey, two levels. My, my my phones are so big. When I'm commentating, I've always got to make sure I put it face down because sometimes we do what they call a working man shot, where it's a you shot of the commentators. It. And if my phone's just there like that, and a text <laughs> message can read through, it. The entire world can read it. You know, <laughs> Anthony Smith's a dickhead. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. But yeah, Chell, uh, he'll just yeah. be on his phone. And they'll say, they'll be counting down, you know, and you'll say, all right, Chael, you ready to go? He'll go, yeah, just whatever, just be, be ready to go in a minute. They'll go, five, four, three, two, one. That was so crazy. It just like turns it <laughs> yeah. on. You're like, whoa. Yeah. It's yeah. wild. He goes full Stephen A. Smith uh, because you're right. He's like a very qu- mild mannered guy. He's Again, so quiet. Very, very respectful. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? No controversy around him whatsoever. Right, you had a bit of a situation. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that there. Oh, controversy. What you mean? Testing positive for every single drug on the planet. You almost going to prison for mortgage fraud. What else have we got? There's a few. Yeah, still I'm undefeated. About, he's still undefeated. Anything, Adam? What? Well, I'm- on Chael? Chael? We're ripping on him now. We're ripping on Chael. I, I can't. Mate, you guys crack on with, on, on the Chael thing. You guys know him. You can get away with it. If I do it, he'll bloom and choke me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, God. You know, the funniest thing with Chael, I've said this many times, when I fought him, everyone thought this was going to be, oh, great. It's going to be that epic trash talk. I was supposed to fight Maya. He was fighting Muno, switch of opponents on like 10 days notice. John Jones refused to do that. I did. You know, I'm not saying I'm the greatest, but, you know, um, he did refuse it, though. Um, so we didn't have time 
for, for trash talk or anything like that. It was all about mental energy into changing and preparing for this style. And then when we squared up in Chicago on the stage at the ceremonial weigh-ins, I'm here, he comes up, and I'm going to go head to head and like, you know, give it a bit of that shit. And when he gets in close, he, he, you've probably seen this. He goes, what is that cologne you're wearing? You smell fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I was ready to like motherfuck him. And he's like giving me compliments on my, on my aftershave. Do you know what I mean? I was like, you son of a bitch. You completely took down my temperament. That's, that's like his thing too. He's, he, he's the, not to just, I guess, big up Chael too much because he doesn't need, he doesn't he's need to hear it from me, but he, uh, he like is the guy that gives compliments to everybody. When we're getting walked through an arena on the way to go do the show or something, he'll stop five or six times to tell a waitress or a bartender or a server like, Oh, where did you get those shoes? I really love those shoes. I'd love to get them for my wife. And I'm always thinking you are so full of shit. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> but he just, well, he has terrible. to compliment people. Right? It's, it's that's odd. nice. Yeah, that's it's, nice. It's, it's, Adam, you got another? We're going to do a few questions. You good to stick around, buddy? Yeah, go cool, on, man. Go for it. You, you can jump off at any time. Of course, you have a life and all the rest of it. But uh, listen, I'm getting to watch the podcast for free, man. I'm just cracking on. <laughs> there we go. There. Well, everyone gets it for free. You get it wherever you find your podcast. Of course, Spotify, YouTube for the video. I don't know where else it's available, but do your bloody homework and uh, Google it. I should know that shit. Harrington, jump on the show, please. Uh, if yeah. you have a question, you can send it in to bympod at gmail.com. And if you're listening on Spotify, wherever you find podcasts, make sure you subscribe. Leave us a five star rating, positive review. It really helps out on those platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the channel and you hit that notification bell to find out whenever a new video drops. And if you want to catch over 500 episodes you can't get anywhere else, completely ad free and totally uncensored, head to gasdigital.com. Use the promo code BYM. Get a seven day free trial. Check out over 20 great shows on the network. And no, stay I'll on. Stop, I'll stop, I'll stop, here I am. Oh, Brian's here. There Brian we go. Sorry, How I was are late. You, Brian. Uh, well, yeah, we're fine. Um, first question we have today is from a Mr. Luke. Hey boys, how are we? Look at the night shift. Just wanted to know what was your favorite place you've ever worked out. I know this been likes to run. When he was in Perth, he ran along the river there. Pretty sure you said you've run in Singapore before. What was your favorite place? Cheers. It sounds like this is friends with Jerickus. What's my favourite place I've ever worked out? Yeah, man. Adam, you like you like a run, don't you, Adam? Although I do. Even I do. even though I've got no knees, I smoked you when we went running in London. Hey, you still got it. You still, still got, got it, it baby. You? You've got that steady <laughs> pace. You've got that steady pace that grinds people into the ground, and then when they've gone, that steady pace just takes off, man. Away <laughs> yeah, you go. yeah, I did. I was well aware of that. He was still hot on my heels. I'm like, we've got to drag this out by another three miles. <laughs> Best place you've ever worked out, Adam Catchell? Uh, do you know something? Randomly, do you know that you can, you can run the Formula One track in Abu Dhabi? Oh, that'd it's be a, cool. It, it, it's a five-kilometre track. And on Tuesday, I think it's Sundays and Tuesdays, you can go pay and use it as a as a as a running track right so i would probably say the actual formula one track in abu dhabi when i've been out there to cover it for uh for the ufc that is cool that is cool anthony yeah i don't have one i've uh <laughs> get lost i don't, I don't. List. you have a cool list i mean i got a, a cool i mean wherever i was fighting the and mountains of colorado week. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Yeah, running at uh, like 14,000 feet above sea level on um, yeah. one of those mountains is, is that, yeah, that's cool. Grappling hard. with grizzly bears? I've never grappled with a grizzly bear. You know, this has nothing to do You've with You've been in now. there with Magomed Ankalaev. He looks pretty grizzly. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you know, there was a lot of people that were doing running. They were running like just the the little resort we were on in Singapore. And uh, the, the people apparently like the people that work there had to tell a lot of those guys to stop running because they were having some problems with monkeys. So what? like, I don't know if I told this on the podcast, but there was <laughs> like fighters were working out and they were hanging their clothes over their balconies. We all had balconies in this nice ass hotel and they were hanging their clothes over the balconies. And apparently monkeys were climbing up the balcony, stealing people's like UFC gear and sweaty clothes off the balconies. 
How weird is that? I'm, tr- I'm trying to like, think of a fighter that could have been. I said that's a very derogatory term to call such and such, oh, wow. but I can't. I can't think of one. You know what I mean? Harrington. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I know this phenomenon. My in-laws they live in Penang, just off the coast of Malaysia, same part of the world, mm-hmm. and they live in this big penthouse apartment. It makes them sound very loaded. They're not. It's a very, very cheap place to live. Shout out Kate and Graham. Same thing. If they have like a fruit bowl. Mm-hmm. On like the, on the, on the balcony, the monkeys come. They steal everything. The little bastards. Oh, They're a pest. You. Little bastards. Uh, I would say probably Thailand. When I first went, when two thousand four, oh, cool. when I first started training, I went out to Thailand for a few months, and I stayed in this cheap ass hotel. It was the worst. It was the worst. And and like I, I don't like bugs. I'm terrible with insects and spiders and shit like that. And there was cockroaches all over the bloody room. You know what I mean? Oh, but by that. the end, I That's got cool, used huh? to it. I go in. I go in the bathroom in the morning. There's cockroaches running all over my toothbrush. I'll be like, "Hey, lads, boys, how we doing?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got used to it, and then you go on your little jog to the Thai gym, and you're just running through all these neighborhoods, and it's wild because like one house is multi, multi million dollars, beautiful, state of the art. Next to it's like a total shack. You know what I mean? The disparity in wealth, but that doesn't have like nice sections. This right. is where the wealthy people live. That's where the poor live. It's like all kind of intermingled. Uh, and then get to the Thai gym and get your ass whooped in Thai boxing. Ram campaign. Shout out. What was the name of the gym? I should bloody know this. Yeah, no, that was good. Go to Thailand. And everybody, if you're a martial artist, should go and train in Thailand. It's unbelievable. I'd love to do that. Yeah. There it is. You should also go there if you're a weirdo, too. There's like two de- very specific uh, groups of people yeah. that go to Thailand. If you're of a certain age and you have a beer belly and potentially a virgin, it might be a good place to go. <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> so uh, the next question we have here is uh, this one's one everybody can enjoy. This is from Jordan. Hey there, Michael. Hey there, Anthony. Long time believer here. First time questioner. Uh, I figured what better time than being in Clitheroe for the very first time. The Count's hometown itself uh, might as well send a question. Uh, as two drinkers yourselves, an American and a Brit, I'm wondering which country you think has the worst drunks. We all know guys that can hold their liquor legendarily, but which are have the most embarrassing stories for you guys? As a Canadian, uh, I haven't drank that much in the States, but I am torn. Uh, I think the UK has got some shocking displays, but it's because they start at like 6 a.m. for the football. Uh, but anyways, guys, love the podcast for years. I myself am a comedian, Michael, at Funny Jordan D. If you ever need an opener for Tales of the Octagon, I'm your guy. Uh, Harrington, go fuck yourself. You fucking zero. Uh, keep up the work, guys. <laughs> at Jordan D. Thank yeah, you very much. You, First of all, you wow. fucking zero. <laughs> yeah, fucking, that is bad. Harrington, I, I apologize on his behalf. Number one, I know exactly where he is. That is the sign at the base of Clitheroe Castle. So Correct. thank you, Jordan. Yeah, man. Adam. As a man that spent time on both continents, countries, in both, yeah. what do you think? Because our, our drunks, if you go down, what is it, Darwin Street on a Saturday night in Blackburn? <sighs> yeah. Outside the kebab sites. shops? Some sights down there, man. Some sights. Do you know something? I don't necessarily, this comes down to what's what side of the pond you're from. I think it comes down to an age demographic. I think I was, was going to go along that lines too. I think, you know... Us boys, we could go out all day, no bother whatsoever. Stay on the same thing. We've been there. We've we've put we've put the we've put the graft in. We know what works for us. We know what doesn't work for us. We could comfortably start at a midday session, finish in the early hours of the morning, and be right as rain the day after, to a certain extent. It's these young guns, man. You see some of these young guns on a fight week when we're out in Vegas or when we're out in somewhere like even UFC London. And they shoot the bolt far too early, man. They go they go far too early, far too hard. They all think they're rock hard, doing the tequilas and the shots and all this type of carry on. And the next thing you know, you're you're line dancing, aren't you, somewhere on top of a <laughs> on top of a bar. So I would put it down top to an edge. Not, yeah, I think, you know, I think people of a certain age in the States and in, in England, they can handle it. It's these young kids, man. 18 through to, well, obviously the States, 21 years of age through to about 25. They ain't got a clue. Yeah, so I, I go to lots of uh, I've been all over the world, but I I go to lots of sporting events, a lot of professional football games, a lot of college football games. Uh, we're on the road a lot, working the desk. I always try to find what the hot spot is and go check out the city and see it, have a few drinks or whatever, or a lot of drinks, <laughs> whatever. But you're you're right. It's always it's the the people that are my age and and older, even a little, you know, like thirty to you know however old. 
it's always pretty normal. Like I can go to the crazy place, stand back a little bit, chit chat with my friends and watch all these idiots just make an absolute fool of themselves. But everywhere it's that 21 to 27 age range. Mm. that is just an absolute fucking mess it's 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 so fun to watch and i hope they keep doing it because i enjoy every second of watching them do it but you know when we uh, i think the last uh ufc event in austin there's this big area of austin texas that's nothing but bars and college kids Sixth street yeah sixth street it was insane absolutely yeah. insanity the way that i'm going like, in a couple of weeks like these i might actually <laughs> i might actually be going too um so yeah, it was, it was a mess. It was a mess. Like this is, you can see the people that are close to my age that are just kind of stand back with the friends. Like, oh, look at that guy. Look at that guy. It, it's definitely an age demographic in my opinion. Yeah. It's also the alcohol. Let's be honest. Yes. Younger people, because they're not used to the alcohol. You build up a tolerance over time, but also not just age. It comes down to the individual. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Are you the type of person that wants drama following you around? Because there's plenty of people that are my age that I grew up with that when they have a drink, drama follows them around. Like, Adam, we've sat there, right? Me, you and Nick, that day in Vegas, we drank all day. No drama, no arguments, nice time, nice little buzz, meeting people all nice and chill. Other people, because they have this thing in their mind, and I don't know if it's because they are uh, uncomfortable with who they are, how life has panned out, they have insecurity issues or whatever, they start getting a little bit tipsy, they get free with the mouth, and then drama starts to happen. But regardless, England, America, Japan, France, people get shit-faced, bad things start to happen, generally. And I think that's the end of the show. Yeah, that was a good one. So we get shit faced next week in New York, boys, or what? <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> well, what day do you guys get in? Michael, you're in Thursday? I get it. No, I, I, I'll be in Brazil from tomorrow. Well, I fly tomorrow. Yeah. So I land Monday morning, 5.30 a.m. in New York. I'll be there Wednesday with nothing to do. Wednesday's the uh, day then. There you yeah. go. I ain't got nothing on well, Thursday either. Monday, I get in Monday morning. We've got some B, uh, TNT sport obligations. Yep. We've got Wayne show Friday. We've got a post chat for, post fight show on Saturday. Listen, Wednesdays. What is Wednesday. one to do in New York? Exactly, man. <laughs> exactly. You, if you ask my kids, it's the marijuana because <laughs> that's all they see is the signs for like oh really because it's legal now so they're selling weed on all these trucks and stuff so my kids are like is that the place that has all the marijuana <laughs> yep that's where i'm it's, going it's it's advertised everywhere out here yeah. in cali adam i gotta say yes. thank you man really, yeah. really no, thank you gentlemen for having me on your show no, the idea was jump on because I wanted to pick your brains because obviously you're more heavily delved uh, involved with the boxing side of things and the polit politics side of things than I am by far. So I wanted to pick your brains on that. And then you stayed the whole show with us. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone else did. Thank you for joining. Anthony Smith, as always, Mr. Lionheart himself. You guys stay tuned. We'll be back on Thursday. I'll be on location in Brazil. Adam won't be here. Anthony will. Until then, be well. Take care.